Hello, and thank you for joining the Song Live TV peer exchange on chronic myeloid leukemia. The use of tyrosine kinase inhibitors targeting the BCR able protein is a hallmark of therapy for patients with CML. And as you know, it has transformed uh, this disease from a life threatening to a chronic one for most patients. We continue to refine our approaches to monitoring of CML and treatment of resistance to further improve outcome for our patients. In this panel discussion, my colleagues and I will discuss the latest advances in the field, as well as how to apply the new data to clinical practice. My name is Jorge Cortez from the Department of Leukemia at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Joining me today are uh, my colleagues, Dr. Harry Erba, a professor of medicine and director of hematologic malignancy program at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Dr. Kevin Kelly, an associate professor of clinical medicine at the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Southern California. Dr. Javier Pinilla Ibarz, an associate professor for the Department of Malignant Hematology at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. And Dr. David Snyder, an associate chair for the Department of Hematology and Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplant at City of Hope in Duarte, California. Welcome and let's get started. Kevin, um, can you tell us what's the importance or is it how important it is to have an early uh, prompt diagnosis in CML uh, in terms of uh, treatability and prognosis? Yes, yeah, certainly, Jorge. It's important to make a prompt diagnosis early so that these patients can get started on definitive treatment for their CML. The sooner they start on definitive treatment, the sooner they'll reach their treatment milestones, and this can have an impact on their overall survival. Okay. And, um, Harry, we, when we make the diagnosis, uh, you know, we, we, we know patients, by definition, will have the BCR able. We, we've heard about... Uh, mutation analysis a lot, and, and that's part of what our armamentarium of the tests that we do. W when, when do we conduct the, the mutation analysis? How do we do that? Uh, okay, well, it's, you should consider it because we know that the various tyrosine kinase inhibitors have variable activity against BCR able when there are different mutations there. So it may help in choosing treatment in a patient who has failed to achieve the primary milestones at three months, six months, 12 months set by ELN guidelines or the NCCN guidelines, or if a patient has a cytogenetic or molecular response and then loses that response, by doing a sequence analysis of the BCR able uh, fusion and looking at these kinase domain mutations, it may help you select the next um, or the next drug that you're gonna use based on that sensitivity analysis. We don't do it at baseline though. We don't do it at the time of diagnosis because these commercially available assays for the uh, BCR able or able kinase domain mutations have not actually uh, been uh, shown to uh, be useful in choosing first line therapy. Excellent. Now that, that, uh, that brings me to the next question. You know, this, this uh, sequencing that you describe has a level of sensitivity. Now we have uh, better tools or, or, or more sensitive tools that can detect the uh, these mutations um, uh, at, at, at lower levels, uh, like next generation sequencing and, and things like that. So, so have you, is, is there a role? Do we use them now? What is the role of these next generation sequencing for mutations in CML? Sure, uh, Jorge. As you know, uh, technology is changing uh, dramatically in the last years, and the acquisition in our practice of uh, next generation sequencing is really, really there. Uh, so I think uh, from the classical Sanger sequencing right now is, is commonly uh, ordered this next generation sequencing, specifically after amplification of BCR able and really the you know sequencing of the able uh, gene or domain mutation uh, uh, areas as Harry was mentioned, right? Being said that, there is a recent uh, evidence or at least work that has been presented at this uh, meeting which seems like uh, with these very sensitive techniques, there uh, some investigators are able to, to really detect even a very, very low level of mutations and the, even at the diagnosis, something that we have not seen much in the past, or at least have increased the sensitivity of the Sanger uh, techniques. So does that mean uh, we should start sending our, our, our um, patient samples to for, the, uh, for, for the next generation sequencing, 
or is it not quite ready for that point for the clinical use yet? Absolutely. I, I don't think we are quite there yet. I think we are really looking at this data. I think it's a very early information that we have, but I guess it's an area that we're going to continue to investigate. At this point, as Harry said, I think it's very well set up the, the reasons at the times where we should really do these assays, and most of the time these assays can be done by next generation sequencing. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. And, and uh, another methodology that's evolving, um, we, we obviously do monitoring routinely by PCR in all our patients, and, um, and, and, and that's been uh, available for, for many years. Uh, there's also an uh, evolving field, and, and now there is this digital PCR, which uh, has the advantage of being more sensitive, and, and, and so it's been brought up uh, in some of the studies. Um, to, to try to detect the uh, disease at, at, at even lower levels. Um, so, David, how do you see the potential of digital PCR uh, now and, and in the future? So, uh, as you said, it, it, it's a more sensitive way of detecting the B serial transcript. There's less variability in the results, and there's, there's benefit uh, to that. We know with the standard qPCR technique, especially at the low levels, there can be quite a lot of variability. The potential is uh, to detect much lower levels of residual transcripts. So now the standard lower threshold is MR 4.5. And it really comes into play when you talk about discontinuation uh, trials. The criteria for patient to be eligible for those, those trials generally uses a threshold of MR 4.5. And we know that maybe half the patients or so will relapse. With this newer technique, we can potentially get down to MR5, MR5.5, and it may be that people who can reach those lower levels will have a higher success rate after discontinuation. And I say maybe because that's not been shown uh, to be the case yet. But with this technique, it, al it allows us to look at a much deeper level of sensitivity that might be relevant in making those decisions about discontinuation. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because in, in that context of discontinuation, um, some of the studies that have uh, assessed the patients who discontinue therapy and, and, and may even still have holding the response uh, after discontinuation, some of these tests are still positive. So we, we're still trying to understand what exactly that means and, right. uh, and, and, and find the role. So. Right. Um, but it is very interesting technology that so, we're developing. Right. I think the question of the clinical relevance of, yeah. of, of having the ability to detect a lower threshold, that remains to be seen Absolutely. because, as you said, patients may have residual transcript, but clinically that may not be uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very, very good things evolving. 